Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight and the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the The 671st Troop Command of the Iowa National Guard will now fold a flag given to the Iowa Hospital Association by United States Senator Tom Harkin. This flag was raised and flew over the U.S. Capitol Building in Washington, D.C. on January 9, 2010 on behalf of Iowa's hospitals and the patients they serve. At the end of the program, IHA will present this special flag to a Legislative Day participant selected from among those who registered in the drawing. That was Gypsy Jazz Band and the 671st Troop of the Iowa National Guard under the direction of Sergeant Lewis Wolfgram. You may now take your seats. Now please welcome your host for today, IHA Board Chair, Mr. Mark Richardson, President, CEO, Great River Medical Center, West Burlington.
good morning, and welcome to the 17th annual IHA Legislative Day. On behalf of the IHA Board, I want to express my sincere appreciation to all of you for the time you have taken, the distances you have traveled, some of you on icy roads, and the energy you have once again brought to this year's Legislative Day. Today we gather to learn more about the issues affecting our hospitals and take our collective concerns to the State House. This hall is filled with literally hundreds of hospital auxilians, volunteers, trustees, and staff from all corners of the state who are here in the seat of our state's government to represent our hospitals, our communities, the patients we serve, and the countless issues we are facing in this challenging time. Your enthusiasm and dedication helps make this legislative day not only an annual tradition, but a celebration of hospital advocacy and of American democracy itself. We are fortunate to have the ability to talk directly with our elected officials, to share with them our concerns, and ask that they take action. As the citizens of this state and nation and leaders representing an industry that provides over 70,000 jobs to Iowans, who in turn provide care to millions in our state, we have the responsibility to represent our industry and advocate on its behalf. So today we're here to learn, to share, to magnify our message, a message we will then carry to the offices and meeting places of our state senators, representatives, and the governor. You're going to hear some inspiring words and important information today. And should you leave, you will leave here feeling very empowered, knowing that you have the power to enact change, knowing that you have the power to make a difference in our industry and our communities, knowing that you have the power to help those who need it the most. You write letters, make phone calls, send emails, you attend Legislative Day, and you can rest assured that your efforts do not go unnoticed. What you do affects the outcome. Your work today is critical to the future of health care in Iowa. Today is truly your day, and I am confident that you will make the best of it. Thank you again for your dedication to our communities, your hospitals, and the Iowa Hospital Association. At this time, I would like to introduce my guest joining us today, the Director of Spiritual Care at Great River Medical Center in Burlington, Chaplain Randy Gerhardt, who will be providing today's invocation. Randy. I invite you to join me as we pray together. Our gracious and merciful God, today we come to you, we recognize you as our creator, as the sustainer of our lives. We acknowledge you as the giver of every good gift and the healer of our every ill. We thank you for the privilege that we have of being called to our various roles to be a part of your work of healing within healthcare. We recognize that there are momentous challenges and opportunities that lie before us. And we ask for your divine wisdom and guidance in the days ahead. We thank you for all the many blessings that you have so abundantly given to us. We thank you for our men and women in the armed services who are even today serving our great nation. And we ask that you will draw especially close to each one of them. We thank you for this food that we are enjoying. We ask your continued presence and blessing upon everything that is said and done today. And again, most of all, we ask for divine wisdom and guidance in the days ahead. We pray all these things and we give thanks to you for hearing and answering this our prayer. In your mighty and holy name, King of kings and Lord of lords, for now and evermore, amen. Now, please welcome for your lunchtime entertainment, the Gypsy Jazz Band. It's very clear our love is here to stay. 
You have that every day with the expert professional staff from IHA and again you reinforce that when you show up on the hill today and it also takes support of legislators as they run for office in the form of um, financial contributions for their campaigns and you all know that we do that through the Iowa Hospital Association PAC. We want to start off today by recognizing um, some some of our members for their outstanding efforts with the PAC. And we want to start first with our most valuable PAC Players Award. We actually have uh, two of those today. Uh, the first one is St. Anthony Regional Hospital from Carroll. And I'd like to have Gary Reedman, the CEO uh, from Carroll, come up. And we've got an award we want to present to you, Gary. The next one is a bit of a newcomer, and it was really nice to uh, sit down with their new CEO and talk about um, his commitment to political advocacy and the PAC. And so we like to recognize uh, Unity Hospital and Jim Hayes from uh, Muscatine, Iowa. Then we, each year, we uh, nominate for the, uh, the American Hospital Association a grass, grassroots awards winner. And this uh, organization really kind of stood out from everybody else in the past year. It was an easy choice to make. They're very committed to uh, advocacy. They have over 3,000, um, they made over 3,000 contacts through our grassroots advocacy base. Um, they have, um, thousands of folks registered in our um, uh, advocacy database and they do a great job with the PAC. In fact, last year they raised almost $10,000 just from their health system from the PAC and when we raised $120,000 overall, you can see what a big boost that was. And we have the leader of their uh, advocacy and community efforts, Ken Crokin, here this afternoon to accept that award. E pluribus unum. We're all familiar with these words as they appear on all U.S. currency. More significantly, they are the only words on the front side of the great seal of the United States, as well as the seals of the President, Vice President, and Congress. E pluribus unum, translated from the Latin, out of many, one. The story of the great seal's designer, Charles Thompson, is a classic American tale. In 1739, the 10-year-old Thompson left Ireland with his brothers and recently widowed father aboard a ship bound for Britain's American colonies. His father didn't survive the journey, and once in port, the orphan boys were separated. Adopted by a blacksmith's family in Delaware, Thompson never took up the trade. Instead, he trained as a scholar and became an active leader in the Sons of Liberty, the patriots who made it their mission to be a thorn in the British side. He was a member of the Continental Congress from its inception, served the entire time as secretary, and he signed the Declaration of Independence. Thompson conceived of the Great Seal in 1782 after several other designs were rejected by Congress. His original drawing 
and description are now in the National Archives. The last sentence of the description reads, in the bill of the eagle, a scroll with these words, E Pluribus Unum. No further explanation was given. Perhaps in the scholar's eyes, no further explanation was needed. For more than a century and a half, no further explanation was called for as E Pluribus Unum stood as the nation's national model. But it was a de facto designation. No official act had ever created a national motto. That is, until 1956, when Congress codified In God We Trust as the official motto of the United States. The meaning of E Pluribus Unum was clear and simple enough to Thompson. From the 13 colonies, also symbolized in the Great Seal, was the United States of America formed. Out of many, one. Yet the powerful elegance of those few words is nearly overwhelming when you consider what was necessary to make them and then keep them truthful. How many campaigns and demonstrations have been held? How many speeches, bills, and laws have been written? How many disagreements, conflicts, and all-out wars have been fought? How many lives have been lost? And perhaps more significant, how many lives have been saved? E Pluribus Unum is not just a statement of fact. Actually, I'm not sure it was meant to be taken as fact at all. To me, E Pluribus Unum is not about explaining what had happened, but about committing to what must be. Out of many, one is not a declaration from history. It is a challenge to posterity. It is our nation's mission. A mission statement provides a framework from which a company or organization formulates its strategies. In other words, it provides the essential answer to the basic question, why are we doing this? The best mission statements are short and every word is meaningful. Out of many, one certainly meets this criteria. Out of is just another way of saying from. Our model of governance is designed to be bottom up, of the people, by the people, and for the people. The government derives its power upon the consent of the governed. Many obviously speaks of the population, but which population? In the context of the Great Seal at the time of its conception, the many were the 13 colonies and the 2.5 million people who lived there. But not all were treated equally, not those who were female and certainly not those who were enslaved. Those oversights were corrected, to put it mildly, as we sought to make a more perfect union that truly represents the many. But we will never be perfect because there are so many of the many out there after all, we are a nation of groups. We are families, neighborhoods, cities, and states. We are schools, manufacturers, and service providers. We are the greatest generation, baby boomers, Generation X, and millennials. We are conservative and liberal, Democrat and Republican, red state and blue state, and none of the above. And yet we are one, though never really completely. But we are one enough, enough to peacefully campaign, vote, and change our local, state, and national leadership every few years, and sometimes every year. One enough to form groups, debate the issues, and peacefully live with the results. One enough to be the most generous, most optimistic nation on earth. How can a nation so diverse in its people and its ideas make this work? How do we do it? Because we value and empower each of each one of the many, each individual, with liberty. Because the ultimate one in the system is not a dictator, it is an individual exercising the God-given right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. We know we can do this as a nation because we do it on our own every day as we manage our lives, careers, and relationships. We know we can do it because we do it every day as spouses, family members, neighbors, and employees. I, knew, I know we can do it because I believe in and will protect your right to try, just as I know you extend the same right and those same protections to me. Out of many, one. It really is a breathtaking mission statement when you recognize that it's not just about the nation that Charles Thompson helped form more than 230 years ago. It is about the nation we have become and will become 
It is about the choices we can make as organized groups and individuals. It's about being free. So go up to the Capitol today to exercise your freedom. Share a fact or two about your community hospital. Share an opinion or two about how your legislator can help support your local hospital. And revel in the understanding that these are the simple acts that have been executed for over two centuries that make our democracy work. Have a great day. Thanks again for coming. When Iowa holds its presidential caucuses, Stephen Schmidt gets almost as much attention as some of the candidates. He has appeared on a live CNN broadcast from the campus of Iowa State University, bantering with host Paul Begala and Tucker Carlson, as well as on BBC, National Public Radio, CNBC, and in the Chicago Tribune, USA Today, the Christian Science Monitor, and Washington Post. Professor Schmidt can be heard as Dr. Politics on Iowa Public Radio and is a graduate of Columbia University, where he earned his Ph.D. in public law and government. Schmidt is co-author of the best-selling American Government College textbook, American Government and Politics Today. Please welcome today's keynote speaker, Dr. Politics, Stefan Schmidt. Well, thank you, folks. It's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm always honored when I get invited to uh, speak with Iowans and especially folks like you who dedicate so much of your time to an important cause and important issues. I'm going to talk very briefly uh, about, let, let, me, let me tell you what I wrote a, a, a couple of minutes ago. I said, what I share with you today are the perceptions about health care and health insurance in this complicated, e pluribus unum country and state. I didn't have e pluribus unum in there before uh, Ken started talking, but yeah, so then uh, Kirk, I'm sorry, and but I added that. Um, I also want you to know that they may not be my opinions or my prescriptions for health care reform. The opinions expressed here may not be those of this station, its management, this organization, or even this guest. Uh, I am the bearer of some good and some bad news, but I take no credit for any of it um, because I'm simply a transmission to you of what is going on. I just finished my radio show on Iowa Public Radio uh, at 10 to 11 down the street here in their studio. The entire show today, we do it every Wednesday at 10 o'clock, 6.40 on your AM dial, or streaming live on the internet at iowapublicradio.org, uh, was on health care, health reform. The summit meeting that is going to take place between President Obama and Republicans I urge you to look at today's New York Times, which I have here. The front page of it has two interesting stories uh, about that meeting, which is a kind of interesting phenomenon after an entire year of discussing health care, health insurance, health reform, the costs of health care, and um, we now are waiting to see what emerges from this particular meeting. And what was interesting was that there was actually a lot of skepticism that this is really about health care and health reform and insurance. There were a lot of people who said this is really about politics. And it is, to me at least, both fascinating and also to some extent tragic that something as important as health care, which is uh, something that no one can live without, should have become so politicized that we are now very cynical about uh, how, to, how to address it in the political arena. I think the Iowa legislature is a much better venue. Uh, people know each other, respect each other more, are more respectful to each other. You're closer to them, and it's wonderful uh, to know that citizen participants in the United States, such as you, are willing to take out the time from your busy lives to try and shape public policy. If we could do this in Washington, D.C., 
health care reform would have taken a completely different direction and shape, we would have had a more serious discussion uh, than what has happened. I'm not going to bore you with too many numbers, so I'll skip through those because I know that you're familiar with them. Um, by 2050, just simply paying interest on the national debt would consume more than half of the annual revenues of the federal government, and those three, Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid, uh, are growing much faster than the economy. And as the economy fails to grow fast enough, the percentage of those increases uh, geometrically. There's an article today in the business section of the New York Times, and one of my former students, uh, Steve Wood, uh, at Iowa State, is now the chief market strategist for uh, Russell Investments, said that the economy isn't really dead and consumers are damaged but not dead. He said things are not deteriorating, but they're not really measurably improving in terms of especially housing and jobs. And as that happens, you all know how that reverberates into things such as uh, health care and health insurance. So the economy on one end of this is a crucial factor, as you all know, and we need to keep our eye on that. Um, eliminating the fiscal gap through 2050 would require tax increases right now or program cuts that would be about 3.2% of the total wealth of the United States all the way through 2050. You notice I have, 20, I have an obsession with the 2050. Uh, it would be politically impossible and it would be uh, not a very good idea uh, to attempt to do that and to increase taxes by 18% uh, and reduce all programs by 15%, including Social Security, Medicare, defense, anti-terrorism, education, veterans benefits, and so on, would be an incredible trauma on American society, and it would certainly affect, uh, as you know, uh, the healthcare system. We are faced with the necessity of having both sides, the revenue and the expenditure side of the budget, on the table when we talk about how we are going to address this issue. And unfortunately, on the uh, revenue side, we have become a country that is reluctant to deal with revenue, to raising more funds and finding more ways of financing things. And on the expenditure side in health care, we are struggling with ethical issues and moral issues, and as well as political issues, because we rarely want to talk about how we are going to ration health care. We rarely talk about how we are going to essentially deny health care at some point or reduce health care at some point in people's lives because we just can't seem to address that from a moral perspective. And that is a challenge, as you know, because as this country gets older, and I'm getting older uh, by the day, um, we are facing those things as we get older, and we are having real problems in sorting them out uh, as, as issues that we can uh, basically deal with. So there are organizations, uh, Imagine 2050 is a blog that talks about this. It seems like 2050 is a long ways off. I know that you folks have to be back at the State House at one o'clock. Uh, that's more realistic in terms of a time frame. But 2050 for healthcare, for reform, for how to rebuild the American economy and how to wrestle down this massive deficit that we have it really isn't that far off. Um, when I came to Iowa State in 1970, I thought that 2010 was way off and I didn't even know where I would be. I'm fortunate to have been at Iowa State for 40 years and I'm really thrilled that I am in Des Moines, Iowa today in 2010, but it seemed very far off. Well, 2050 is coming pretty soon, and I think we can uh, uh, at least begin to talk about how we are going to move in the short term, but also how we are going to move in the long run. Obviously, we have a real deep and very trying conflict between public and private solutions. I would say 
when someone asks me, and, and I do a lot of media, I, I, I don't know who has that voice that announces in here, but I, I want that voice. That's the most fabulous voice, and you heard that I do a lot of media. Um, I did the New York Daily News yesterday, very long interview on healthcare reform, on whether the White House meeting is going to accomplish something. And the problem is that we have this really deep conflict between private and public solutions, between looking at healthcare as a public good, as a, a something that American society owes to every American to some degree, and at the same time, the fact that we are a capitalist country, that the prosperity of this country has been driven by the fact that people create organizations and institutions, companies, laboratories, hospitals, care facilities, and then make them commercially viable through good business practices. And when it comes to the cost of healthcare reform, the funding of how to deliver healthcare, we are really at this point struggling with how to separate out this idea of healthcare as a public good and healthcare as a commercial product. And no wonder this debate is so very difficult. I'm not going to show you little video clips that I have simply to save some time, but um, I have a little uh, video clip of the Heritage Foundation, which is very, very business model driven and says public health, you know, that's something we can talk about, but basically the United States is a capitalist country. We want private solutions and we want the private sector to be able to do this. Um, and then, of course, there's the opposite argument, which is that health care costs and health insurance costs and costs of Medicare and costs of veterans' health care and the costs of Medicaid are bankrupting us. They are slowly driving states to shift more and more of their revenue and their spending to that sector away from other things. And I don't know about you, but I need some asphalt in those potholes in Nevada. Uh, I have a big SUV, but the wheels just aren't big enough to take some of those. So we have these conflicting interests, and when you go to the State House, you'll feel that anxiety among legislators between health care and, and, and that important value that we have, that necessity that we have, and those other pressures that are coming. I'm in the State House frequently, and every few days now, as we come to the zenith of the session, there are other interests in the State House with exhibits, with t shirts on, with their name tags, shaking the hands of uh, Rod Roberts and others and, and saying, We want to tell you why you need to listen to us. Ours is the most important issue for the state legislature this year and that can be labor issues or education or other things. And so there are these competing interests that are so difficult because, of course, I know and you know that health care is the most important one. And if there is any extra money, it ought to be diverted to health care, right? Don't we know that? Yeah. I mean, in, in, you know, next week when I give a talk to the teachers of Iowa, Association, it might not be healthcare anymore, because I do tailor my my uh, my comments to the to the audience. Uh, but healthcare certainly is important, uh, and you have a very very good case to make. Um, I have a little list here of of the those things that are important that you should remember when you go back again this afternoon to talk to folks, and that is we have multiple players. Those players are all very important in helping us to find solutions, but they're often very conflicting players in the, in the discussion over healthcare reform. And you can see that you know what they are. I mean, the insurance companies and some of the best in the world are down the street from here and are growing and prospering and are the pride of Iowa as the second largest in, in Des Moines as the second largest insurance center in the United States. You have the healthcare industry, you have public opinion, and there you have a conflict between those who are insured and not insured, and you know that. 
the reason why this Obamacare and the whole health care debate has been so passionate and has been so difficult is because if you have something, the fear of losing it is much greater than any promises about better betterment in the future. And, and a lot of Americans have good access to health care, have health insurance, and can afford it in one form or another, and feel very threatened by all of the discussions about how to essentially bring change. You notice President Obama has decided to, to now move away from the word change. This week, this week, the president decided that it's not so much about change, which sounds more threatening, it's really about reform. It's really about fixing. It's about tweaking, making th little things happen. Because really what happened was when you talk about major change, you are disrupting people's lives and making people nervous about what that all means. And I know that all of you are very wise and savvy, and my friends back there in the news media uh, are very important. Uh, because very often on an issue such as this, it is very difficult to understand what all this means. Uh, and there's a lot of neat stuff around in the internet, and this was a kind of a sarcastic little poster. Universal healthcare for all citizens? Don't be silly. Um, that kind of thing is only for every other industrialized nation. We're in the business of war, not welfare. Well, you know, you can find all kinds of messages out there, but certainly the comparison of the United States to other countries is important. Uh, I think this is a problem, complexity, some of you, I uh, may not be able to see these slides, so I'm sorry I'm actually repeating these by word. Uh, I don't really think anybody understands the full complexity of the health care and health insurance system in the United States. And I apologize to you because you are experts on it. This is your whole life. Some of you are distinguished, nationally known individuals. I still don't think you know everything there is to know about health care and health reform because it's too complicated. It is like taxes. Wilbur Mills was the only member of Congress who ever really understood the American tax law. Then he fell into the basin with a stripper in Washington, D.C. and discredited himself. But he did under, you remember that, Wilbur Mills? He was great. But he did understand the U.S. tax code. He, he was the go-to guy. I don't think there is any go-to guy or woman in the United States for health care. It is simply too complicated and intertwined with too many other values. You know, should, we, should the military and veterans have their own health care system or should the vet, Veterans Administration be blended in and done away with? What about Medicare? What about Medicaid? How big should the role of government be? Should individuals, a guy called this morning to the show and said, we should do away with everything, everything. Do away with all of that and we would have the whole healthcare problem solved. Why? He said, because you'd go in to see your doctor and your doctor says, well, you know, let's do an MRI and let's do a CAT scan and let's do these tests. And you go, how much is that going to cost me? Well, it'll be about eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000. I don't want that. Do you have anything cheaper that you can do for me? And the whole point was, if it wasn't paid for by insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, or the Veterans Administration or someone else, the cost factor would go away. People had to write their own checks and pay by cash or with their visa card. We would have it all under control. Well, that seems nice, nice idea. Ain't gonna work. It is, it, most healthcare today requires the pooling of risk. We have, insu we have car insurance. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to pay car insurance or house insurance on our homes? You know, every year you get these bills. You know, just, you know, if your house burns down, build another one, write a check for it, you know? Uh, well, no, we pool our risks. We put together healthy people and sick people and old people and young people, liberals, Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, all of the a pluribus unum people, we put them all together in a group and they all contribute some money. And then when one of them gets sick, we take out of that pool to pay for it. 
You know, if we don't have that, then we all become predators. We are all out there, and the ones who have a checkbook and a credit card can go in and get their health care, and they'll say, yeah, give me, a, give me a couple of MRIs at least, you know, what the heck, because I can afford it. And the ones who can't afford it are not going to get health care. And I, it seems to me a lot of people don't understand that. So complexity is a really big problem. This is by a neuroscientist, by the way, who paints. And all of his paintings are about complexity. And I guess I thought I would use, uh, with his permission, that particular picture, because that's a big problem. 60% um, of US firms offer health benefits to any of their workers. And I say only 60%, because the rest then are, have to be cared for in other ways. And you know that premiums are going up, and they're at 13,375 a year, except the rates are going up uh, very quickly, uh, much more quickly. And this is the new Kaiser Family Foundation uh, report that you probably have seen, or you can Google it on the internet. Um, healthcare is up 131%, wages 38, and inflation 28. So um, costs are rising very quickly. Problems with having employer-based insurance is discrimination against older workers. You know about um, this company where uh, one, employ, uh, one employer hired a, a, a person who was 40 years of age and they immediately raised the rates because it was an older person, 40 years. I wish I was 40. Uh, I don't think that's old age. Um, it's in discouraging firms from offering healthcare insurance and it forces employees to th employers to think twice about hiring new workers. So it's, it's not very good. And um, deductibles are going up uh, at small firms uh, from three to 199 workers. 40% uh, of them face deductibles of 1,000 or uh, other, other uh, basically um, rising expenses. And this is a chart that you've probably all seen going up to 2020. I couldn't find one for 2050. We just can't project that far. But, you know, it's, it's, it's too unstable an environment. You can see it begins with uh, 1999, 11% of the median family, um, and then it keeps going up until 2020. It's almost up to 25%, um, at 25 of family's income for insurance premiums, so um, that is troublesome. Uh, we know that Medicare is uh, a problem, um, and the mil millions of seniors who signed up for private health care plans through Medicare are now facing extremely uh, high um, increases in, in premiums, um, and the Medicare population, of course, well, some of us, I see some other folks my age, and a little bit older, and those of you who are the baby boomers, 70 million um, in 2025, rising from 40 to 70 million. Uh, how are we going to manage Medicare when everybody is eligible? Well, almost a third of Americans are eligible, and that is a real problem. Um, Low-income elderly women in poor health now spend about 52% of their income for out-of-pocket health care. And imagine it's going to go up to 72% by 2020. Well, you can't spend 72% out of pocket uh, for something. Uh, what are you going to do for rent and other things? So really serious problems. Not going to talk too much about the Commonwealth Fund report, but it's a very good one. It says we need to, to cover the uninsured, enhance affordability of insurance coverage, and control the rise of health care costs, which is not much of a... Uh, an issue, but achieving the first goal uh, without the second and third, you, you can't do that. You have to cover the uninsured. We have to have something like that. And we have to slow insurance costs as well. Um, if you get a chance, talk to Jack Hatch. Good guy. Don't agree with everything he does. One of my students, of course. Uh, and Jack, uh, I have a little interview here, which I won't play. Uh, you can go see it at insideriowa.com. I left some cards up on that table. I don't know if you all got those or not, but it's a new internet magazine that I started with Stan Brewer, and um, the interview with Jack Hatch is there, so you can go watch it there. It's a little digital video. 
Um, but we are talking about health care insurance in the U.S. We should have talked about health care reform long ago. Actually, we did. Yeah, we did. This chart is Nixon, Carter, and Clinton. If Nixon had been able to put together with Ted Kennedy a health care reform uh, of some sort, the rise in the cost of health care as a percentage of the economy would have only been that purple line, that's the, the Nixon line, because it would have fixed some things that drove up prices. You see 10.7% there. Well, it didn't happen, all right? What if Jimmy Carter had managed to get some health care reform? Well, then it would have slowed down uh, to, to and, and, and flattened out to 11.5%. Well, it didn't happen. Well, what if uh, Clinton had managed with Congress to put through some, some sensible health care? Well, it didn't happen. So it went up to 14.2%. Well, what if Bush uh, or Obama were able to get it through? Well, it's getting late. It's getting late because we have dug ourselves into a hole. We want to avoid health care reform. We, we, we try, but it's so political, we can't get it done. And if we can't get it done this time, that curve of costs there, as you can see, is going to keep going up, and the expenses are going to keep rising. So the federal government would have been a big beneficiary if, if we had gotten regular health care reform, normally done, sensible, good stuff, and instead of consuming 6.2% of the GDP in 2010, um, federal outlays would have been about 3.7%. Uh, and Nixon, Nixon's reforms would have helped, and others as well. Rises of, in, causes of rising costs, let's not get into all that, you know what that is. Government paperwork, new technology, high insurance company profits, malpractice, fraud, and so on. This is the cartoon that says, this is a healthy profits insurance company. Are you crazy? A government healthcare system would be a bureaucratic nightmare, and that's the owner of the company, and you can see the bureaucratic nightmare of all these little computers saying no, no, no. That's obviously a cartoon by someone who is critical of the health industry. And I apologize to those of you who are in that industry. Um, and uh, we have an aging population. I have already told you that. And you looked in the mirror this morning and realized that anyway. And so here's what we've got. You know, we are at 2010, 40.2% of people um, in the US, 65 or over, shift over to the last bar chart in 2030. Um, and we're going to have large numbers. Um, and that's, uh, I'm sorry, that's 40.2 million, and it'll be 72.1 million over 65 in 2030. And this is the chart that shows you as, you're, as you get older, as the age increases, how much healthcare, per capita healthcare spending increases. You can see those of you who are 75 or over there at the very end are costing a lot of money to yourselves and to, to the rest of society. Aging just simply costs a lot of money. We have ob obesity and we have very bad problems with, in the United States with, with healthy food and healthy habits, exercise and so on. And uh, these are some of my favorite pictures that I use in my American government class because immediately you see the students put away their chocolate bars and put the caps on their pop and so on. Um, 2009 poll, 72% of Americans are worried that if someone in their family becomes seriously ill, their health insurance may not cover the medical bills. 47% uh, is very worried about inadequate health care coverage. 65% worry that if they lose or change their job, they might lose their health insurance. 60% say they worry that if someone in their family becomes seriously ill, their health insurance might drop the coverage. 56% worry that if they lose or change jobs, they may not be able to afford health insurance. Those are important polls. This is a poll from Nevada just from this last week. 34% support the current Senate bill. 32% of independents support the current Senate bill, which is not current anymore, really. 58% uh, support a public option. 61% of independents support a public option in Nevada. And 55% support reconciliation on health care. And 64% of independents support reconciliation. I know, you know, politicians, they always talk in their own little language. You know, why don't they just use normal words? What's reconciliation, you know? Well, reconciliation is that instead of passing a whole bill, you go, well, we're just going to take all these little pieces and vote on them. You don't have to have 
uh, 60 votes in the Senate to stop a filibuster because with reconciliation, you can pass all kinds of little pieces as long as you have a majority. I, I, I think, I'll be honest with you, I think President Obama is gonna grab the Democrats, smack them across the head and say, start passing reconciliation health reform now. Um, and the Democrats until 2010 are gonna have a majority in the House and Senate to pass all kinds of legislation at the federal level. After 2010, when the Republicans take over the House and Senate, then the Republicans will have to figure out how to do health. Oh, did I say that? I'm sorry. Uh, my, my Democrat, my D friends don't like me to say that, but I have a crystal ball, so that's why I'm called Dr. Politics. Um, confusion, confusion, look at this. Americans began favoring health reform. Uh, you see the black line and very few of them opposed it. More and more opposed it as they saw the process happening. Fewer and fewer supported so that now 51% oppose health, the, the health care plan as if there were one. And one reason is that th there has been so much confusion and also media hype, death panels, Obamacare, big government, all kinds of discussions and real risks that uh, Medicare and other programs are going to be tampered with. So there has been a change, even though the other polls show that Americans would like something done about health care reform. Uh, you know about the rising costs in Iowa and other places. Uh, did you know that there is an alternative cost containment method for health care? Yes, there is. This is from my latest issue of, um, I guess, Business Week. Bloom it's not called Bloomberg's Business Week. The private sector solution to health care reform, if nothing else happens, is that the big, the big lizards go out and eat up all the little lizards. The big companies go and buy up and swallow and incorporate all the little insurance companies. Why would that be a cost reduction and contain management strategy? Because by eating up all the little companies, you spread your risk and you essentially end up with a larger business model from which you can then work and it would allow companies to regulate the delivery of healthcare and essentially deal with it. Um, it's a big business, 2.5 trillion in 2009, US healthcare spending. I saw the figures for Iowa, and you folks really contribute to the economy of the state, a lot of jobs, a lot of uh, wonderful services, uh, and if we don't do something, there will be a, a lot of um, large companies buying up little companies, so. Um, I think I was at the State House last week. Was this last week? Anybody remember? Do you know what this was? Anybody? Who was there at this? And no, no, nobody here was there? Wow, interesting. Well, there are lots of people at the State House, I tell you. And they are there uh, pushing for um, health care discussions and other things. And as I said, um, it is a, a scary process, and it is incomprehensible to a lot of people. And I guess I would end by simply saying that, um, and I think uh, Kirk Norris already said this in a different way, that you are the very best messengers, both to the legislature and to the public, to help clarify and also to help to dispel some of the confusion that exists. You are, because you understand it. So when you leave here, I'm five minutes over, I'm done. You will go, get on the buses, I think, and go there, and you really know what you're talking about. And the legislature needs to hear from people like you, but also talk to the media. Go find some Des Moines Register reporter, go find somebody who's got a big, huge, not one of those little, uh, video camcorders like Stan Brewer has. By the way, we're going to have a little bit of this on InsiderIowa.com on our magazine, a little bit of, of, of my talk. So if you were asleep because of the heavy dessert, you can go there and watch part, watch part of it again. I, I think there was a heavy dessert. I didn't get any, but I, there was no dessert. Oh, cheap organization. All right. Um, I think you are the very best messengers to the legislature 
And they want to know, and the media wants to know, and the public wants to know. So please go there and explain to them how this works, why we have to do some interesting new things. And your organization, of course, is fantastic. And I congratulate you for all your work. And you are providing the answers that are not coming from Washington, DC. And that is why not only are we e pluribus unum, but as a federal system, we have the wonderful opportunity to not wait for Washington to do things. We are a country where we can solve problems at all kinds of different levels. And this is a very big one. And let's start solving it at this level. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now, please welcome IHA Senior Vice President, Mr. Greg Botenhammer. Please join me in another round of applause for Professor Schmidt. I think it's very appropriate that we have Dr. Politics here with us today, given your role in our advocacy efforts. Um, but I thought this afternoon maybe we should start with a basic understanding of the word politics. By breaking the word down in Greek, we know that poly means the art of government. And ticks, well, you all know what ticks are. Um, from the Greek, that means those who are elected. But um, in all deference to our legislators in the room, I actually thought that up before I knew you were going to be here. <clears throat> As a lobbyist, there's very few groups of individuals I can make fun of, so forgive me for them. In all seriousness, Iowa's elected officials are well-meaning individuals. They're your friends and your neighbors. They attend your local church. Their children and grandchildren attend the same schools that your family has, sometimes for generations. They sacrifice much to serve your communities. They're all good Iowans. But in the hubbub of the Iowa General Assembly, sometimes they can get distracted. They can forget some of the true pillars of their communities, like their local hospital. And that's why it's so important that you're here today to remind them of that reality. I'd like to just pause for a moment and share with you a brief television commercial sponsored by the Iowa Hospital Association this spring that we hope draws some of the, this attention to the central role your hospital plays in your hometown. I'd like to play that now. This is your Iowa hospital, a place for curing and caring, the home of helpers and heroes, centers of excellence, a magnet for growth, a symbol of hope, a light in the dark that never goes out. This is your Iowa Hospital, the Iowa Hospital Association. We care about Iowa's health. Thank you. I hope many of you have had the opportunity to see that. It's running on television stations all across the state. Today, you're here to share the message about access to health care for our citizens, particularly our most vulnerable citizens. As the national discussion on health care reform continues to drag out, we in Iowa remain blessed. We have, by most accounts, one of the top two or three overall health care systems in the United States. We have one of the highest rates of insured citizens of any state in the nation. And your hospitals provide some of the highest quality care at some of the lowest costs that can be found anywhere. Yet you might hear from legislators today that health care costs are too high and that hospitals are part of the problem. But has anyone here heard that Iowa gets one of the lowest Medicare reimbursements of any state in the country? A few hands have heard that. And do you know that Iowa's own Medicaid program, the state's insurance program for the poor, pays hospitals even less? The reality is that your hospital is expected to perform miracles every day when payments are continually being reduced such as in December of last year when the governor initiated a 5% Medicaid reduction for hospitals and physicians. This caused a loss of more than $18 million in state and federal money for Iowa hospitals. And now with the Iowa General Assembly faced with even greater budget difficulties, recent Health and Human Service budget targets call for an additional, additional $172 million in reductions, which certainly does not bode well for Iowa hospitals. 
The Iowa Hospital Association stepped up to the plate to help. The IHA board has endorsed a three-year plan to assess our largest hospitals, $40 million, to act as a state share of Medicaid to match federal funds. These dollars would then be used both to increase hospital Medicaid payments and to provide $65 million of state and federal funds to support Iowa's Medicaid program. Now, I know it's a little complicated, and it's not easy to follow, but it's a plan that other states have used and one that the federal government approves. It's a way that hospitals are willing to help, to help the state on a short-term basis. It's not a tax increase, and it doesn't impact patient bills at all. But it's a way hospitals are willing to help the state in these challenging budgeting times. Today, we need to tell your legislators to support the IHA proposal and to oppose any other changes to that concept. There's one other issue that I want to bring to your attention today. Bills in the House and the Senate would provide some due process protections for well-meaning caregivers who are placed on the dependent, adults, dependent Adult Abuse Registry by the Department of Inspections and Appeals. Currently, when DIA conducts an investigation, the agency doesn't have to tell the hospital or the individual that they're even suspected of adult abuse. And they cite people for things like simple administrative mistakes or attending to other patients in an emergency as, as uh, abuse situations. There are no protections or hearings in such cases, and people have sometimes lost their jobs and even their careers needlessly. Now, no one supports true dependent adult abuse, but this is an issue that needs addressing to protect hospital employees from a rogue government agency. Please ask your legislators today to support Senate File 2333 and House File 2154 to ensure that all hospital workers have the right to appropriate counsel in these circumstances. So you have four mes your message today has four points. First, Iowa must sustain its Medicaid program, including appropriate payment levels to health care providers. Second, Medicaid cuts mean a real loss of jobs in your community. Third, the Iowa General Assembly should support the proposal put forth by the Iowa Hospital Association to assist in this regard. And fourth, the General Assembly should protect individual rights in abuse investigations. Now at your plates today, you have some talking points on a sheet of paper to help guide you in your discussions. Uh, they talk about the hospital assessment plan and both the bills related to the Department of Inspections and Appeals. Importantly, take your pens out and mark off the last bullet point. That's a mistake from last year and those bills don't exist. Makes your job just that much easier. We put a blank for your legislator's name on there and we hope that if, as you visit with your legislators, you'll put their name there and any notes on the back of this sheet that you care to leave us with in terms of information and drop them off at the IHA uh, information desk which will be on the second floor at the Capitol. But the most important thing for you to leave in the mind of your legislator today is that your hospital is a vital health care and economic force in your community. You represent an essential part of the fabric of life that is Iowa. Hospitals make a difference in the lives of your fellow citizens every day. The Des Moines Register recently called hospitals one of the most influential and powerful lobbying groups in Iowa. That's only true because of the, de the dedication of some 74,000 hospital employees who serve their communities every day. It's only true because people like you come out to the IHA Legislative Day every year to share your stories with your elected officials. You are the voice of Iowa hospitals, and we thank you for being here today. Now, when we break in a few moments, those of you who came in buses will, ex will exit on the south side of the convention center. Those of you who need rides to the Capitol can catch the IHA buses on the north exit. Um, and when referencing those uh, talking points, as I mentioned a minute ago, if you have a red circle on your talking points, you may redeem that at the table in the back to win one of the IHA coffee mugs that we're handing out today. So if you have a red circle, make sure you stop by the, oh, we have a winner. Yeah, okay, we had a winner over there. And finally, we do have the tradition of drawing the name of the individual who will receive the flag that was discussed earlier that was flown over the U.S. Capitol. So Mark, would you come up and draw a name out of this box for us? Our winner is Robert Cates from Mason City, Iowa, from Mercy North, Iowa. And Mr. Cates, when we're finished, if you'll come up here, I have the flag and a certificate that we'd like to present to you. So thanks again to everyone today. We appreciate your efforts. 
Uh, you're making a huge difference. Have a great day at the Iowa Capitol.